wanna finish what you started? You came to the right place. The girls that you came with, you might have to part with. Depending on how this thing shakes. Wabatosa, Kenosha, Economic is in the house. And if you All right, what's up, Wisconsin? And welcome back to the New Look Podcast. And today we're gonna to be taking a new look at defense innovation with my good friend, Mike Brown. Can I call you Mike Brown? Do most, most people call you Mike? I've always called you Mike, right? Yeah, Mike is great. You call, does anyone call you Michael? Like if you're in trouble, do you? Uh, my, you my mother still calls me Michael. Okay. So maybe not a good, good thing for this. Same with mine. Everyone calls me Mike, but then if I, my mom is angry, she says, Michael John, Michael John. Mike, John. Uh, Mike thanks for, for joining us. Um, I, uh, I first got to know you, I think, when someone sent me a, a analysis you had done, which I think was in PowerPoint form, maybe in 2017. Is that, does that sound about right? right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. About China uh, and specifically China's investment in certain industries in the United States and how we were not aware of what was happening. This was a real wake up call for me. And I think you were very much ahead of the curve in terms of what I would now call a new Cold War. You don't have to agree with that. But regardless of what you call it, there's been a massive shift on US-China policy. And so I want to talk about that primarily. But before we do, I want to figure out how you became the great Mike Brown that you are today. So let's start where are you from, Mike? And do you have a meaningful attachment to where you're from? <laughs> well, I'm from uh, Houston, Texas, and I uh, grew up there until I left for college and uh, thought it was pretty cool to be associated with the space industry. So one of my earlier memories is uh, heading out to the Johnson Space Center to see what, where the astronauts lived and uh, what kind of uh, gear they used, which doesn't every boy if not every american think that's cool and want to be associated with it so but other than that no Did you uh, want to be an astronaut at one point? no 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 i i knew i uh, probably had no chance of being a fighter pilot or an astronaut <laughs> but uh pretty cool to uh, check out uh what's happening at the johnson space center so but you don't have a texas accent did you have it and lose it does it come back if you're it home comes back if you have yeah. a, a cocktail there's the texas accent returns yeah yeah, um, I have tea. Yeah. So uh, I went to college in Boston and the Texas accent wasn't very cool in Boston. And so uh, I think that neutralized it. Where in Boston did you go? Uh, to Harvard. I've heard of this Harvard. Uh, I believe it's a, it's a great online school up in Boston. <laughs> Today uh, it is an online school. <laughs> by the way, I, all you Harvard people just don't want to come out and say you went to Harvard. You have to say... Oh, I, I went to school in Boston. Like, all right, come, right, come on. We don't, you don't well, need to be humble with us, Mike. If you're interested, you ask, and you did. So, okay, I volunteered it. <laughs> and what did you study as an undergrad at Harvard? I studied economics, and uh, I was uh, fortunate uh, to uh, be working also uh, for a professor. And if I worked for Larry Summers, if you remember him as the Treasury Secretary in the Clinton administration. So I was doing, and this will really date me, myself, Fortran programming for him on an IBM mainframe when I went to college there, which wow. wasn't even new technology when I was there in the uh, uh, late 70s and, and graduated in 80. But that's, that's what we were using for uh, computation at that point. Would you describe yourself as a programmer? I mean, you knew kind of the nuts and bolts of, of that? I'm not smart enough to be a programmer, so in today's computer science world, but you could learn some basics of Fortran uh, pretty easily. So I was studying economics. I learned the Fortran on the side. This was in the days when you had to do punch cards. But Mike, you're too remember. You're too young to remember what those are. So when did you pretty graduate? cumbersome. So, so say again. When did you graduate? Uh, 1980. You're right. I was I was negative four, so I don't <laughs> I don't remember that. Yeah. Um, it's nice that you have some older friends. <laughs> uh, I've been described as an old soul. Um, so did you, when you were an undergrad, did you have a sense, a clear sense of what you wanted to do post-college? Did you have a, a vision for your career? And, and how did that vision survive or not survive first contact with post-college reality? Well, I... Uh, uh, 
knew that I was interested in a business career. And so economics was a way of getting really a foundation because economics is a good problem solving discipline. And obviously you're in economics, you're looking at real world problems. So that was a foundation. And uh, I think that served me well. I spent two years in consulting and then came out to uh, Stanford to go to business school. Met my wife in my business school class and we've stayed out here in Silicon Valley uh, ever since. And what was, did you, uh, what did you specialize in in the consulting world prior to business school? Uh, yeah, I was a grunt at a consulting firm, so no specialty, uh, really just working on a variety of different industries that, that that firm worked on. So it was everything from aircraft tires, specialty chemicals, pretty run-of-the-mill uh, U.S. industrial, industrial base businesses. I, I confess to being a bit mystified by consulting as an industry, and some of the smartest people I know either work or have worked at the McKinsey's or the BCG's of the world. But this speaks to my own ignorance. I don't mean this as a, a criticism of consulting, but I just can't get over this, this basic idea that companies who presumably understand their industry and where they want to go within it have to pay millions upon millions of dollars for Ivy League educated 20 somethings to parachute in and tell them how to save their company do you, what are your views on consulting having started in it, but now having a broader perspective? Well, from a career perspective, it's a great place to go and learn. You're working with people who have some more business experience than you do. You get to work with a variety of uh, companies. So you get to see a lot of different industries. And then there are tools. Uh, all of those firms make their money by having toolkits that they regularly apply, which are, what are the basics of cost reduction or at the time uh, I was there, a new idea was the experience curve. So if we do things more and more, uh, that experience allows us to come down a cost curve and there were ways to quantify that. And then out of that came the Boston Consulting Group's idea of the growth share matrix, so how to think about a portfolio of businesses for a diversified company. So you got to learn some of those, uh, some of those tools in the toolkit and then that's what you're applying when you, uh, when you go see a client. Okay, so I was, I was trying to bait you into trashing the consulting industry. You wisely <laughs> didn't take the bait. Uh, okay, so you go to Stanford Business School, and then did you go directly to Quantum after that, or how, what was yeah. the path? Okay. Yeah, so Quantum is a, uh, at that time, a disk drive uh, supplier. That was one of the most vast, massively overfunded uh, industries by venture capitalists in the uh, early 80s. And uh, I went there uh, and started out looking at our competitors. We had about 150 competitors, companies that made disk drives. And that industry is massively consolidated now to about three or four players uh, in the world. So I couldn't have gone to a place that was more, had more competitive intensity to it. It was a great uh, training ground to learn uh, what high tech was about and the, the dynamics that around high tech industries, which are really about moving fast, the importance of having latest generation product. Uh, what you had to do to make sure the product was a great fit for customers because they had so much choice, those sorts of things. And in about a decade or a little bit over a decade, you became CEO of Quantum. And how long were you, 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 were you CEO? And maybe just describe kind of the, the change in the industry and within the company during your time as CEO. Yeah, so uh, one of the things that made this industry so tough was you were following Moore's Law. And in fact, it the industry moved even faster than Moore's Law, which you know really is the doubling of density every, every two years. In fact, in our industry, in the disk drive industry, it was every 18 months. So you had to be on a very rapid uh, curve to uh, figure out how you both increased capacity, because there was ever more demand for storage, and do that at reduced cost. Selling to very large manufacturers of computers, what we called OEMs, or original equipment manufacturers, and uh, that meant that uh, there were very big binary deals. Either you won Apple or you won Dell or you won IBM or you didn't. So very high stakes uh, involved. So a premium on having superior engineering and being able to manufacture at scale. And the life cycle of these disk drives would just be a few years. So you had to ramp up to millions of production uh, in these products and then ramp them down and uh, succeed that with the next one because it's a hardware product, you wanted to make sure as you did that, you didn't have uh, excess inventory uh, that really could spoil all the profits of one of those short product life cycles. Did you, um, 
did you uh, did you interact with DOD during your time at Quantum? And I know you then went to Symantec, but what was your maybe? Oh, let me put it differently. Then, if if you're shaking your head no, what was your perspective on working with the government in general and the defense industry in particular when you were in the private sector? Didn't really know much about it. Uh, we would always sell through someone who would then sell to the government, so either one of the system integrators or our computer. Uh, supplier customers like an IBM or a Dell might supply to the federal government. But that was, we were always one step removed from that. So I didn't really know much about it at the time. And how did you make the transition from Quantum to Symantec? And then how long were you at Symantec? Yeah, so I was CEO of Quantum for seven years and then uh, took some time where I was working with small companies. Uh, decided that I uh, really wanted to spend some time as a, a CEO coach and board member. Uh, and then uh, uh, someone that had been at Quantum who went to uh, a company called Veritas, which was a storage software uh, supplier, as the head of investor relations, introduced me to the CEO. He brought me on the board. Uh, Veritas got bought by Symantec. I stayed on the board of Symantec uh, as those boards consolidated. And then a few years later, uh, this was in 2014, uh, found Myself on the board, we were going to say goodbye to the CEO, and the board asked me to step in to be the CEO of Symantec. So a roundabout way, I had been on the board for about 10 years before I became CEO. So I had a sense of what some of the issues were. That was a real turnaround. Even being on the board, you never see what the issues are until you're in the CEO position. So there were more issues to fix than I had even imagined. But it was a fascinating assignment uh, in, a, in a pretty turbulent time for that company. and that, ultimate uh, strategy decision for me at Symantec was the decision to basically unwind that merger of Veritas to separate the storage software business, which had brought me to Symantec, from the underlying security business, uh, which was Symantec's ongoing strategy. So it sounds like, I mean, at least in the case of Symantec, you didn't start your involvement with them thinking, I'm going to be the CEO of this no. company. There's a bit of serendipity. This is an odd question, but you know, I talk to a lot of young people who I think are very eager to, whether it is in the private sector or, or government, really eager to, I need to be Secretary of Defense tomorrow, or I need to be CEO tomorrow. How did you, I don't know how to phrase this, but how did you kind of manage that ambition that we all have with just a respect for contingency and serendipity in your private sector career? Well, after spending some time at business school, I was ambitious and wanting to be really the uh, leader of marketing. So I had my sights set on being VP of marketing at Quantum, the company I joined after business school. And uh, for me, that happened faster than I thought it might have. But then the career moves started happening faster than I was really planning on them. So I think what's important uh, is to get a foundation in a industry and a functional skill. And hopefully that functional skill will be critical to the industry you join. In other words, if you want to be president of the bank, study finance, right? Uh, so in uh, high tech, it's usually either marketing or engineering. So pick one of the disciplines that's important for that industry and then stick with it for a while. I happen to be at Quantum for about 20 years. So in that amount of time, you really get to know the people, the industry, the competitors, um, how, how the company works, et cetera. So it's pretty easy for me as an uh, internally promoted CEO to understand what we needed to do, having lived through that history and having a good understanding of the company culture. So this gets us to about 2016, 2015 then after Quantum and Symantec. And then, I mean, you had said before, you didn't, you didn't really have much involvement with DOD. Did, did you think a lot about foreign policy at that time? Because your career then takes a bit of a, a turn. <laughs> Left turn. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. I would call it a right turn, Mike, uh, a turn <laughs> in the right direction. Uh, but I'm but, on the uh, left coast, so maybe that's my frame of reference. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, everything outside of Wisconsin is just strategic depth. Um, so uh, so how, did, how did that come about, and, and, and why did you do it? So at Symantec, uh, I really became fascinated by the part of the business that was supporting the government. So we did some things supporting... Uh, the government, in fact, uh, working with Michael Daniels, the former cybersecurity coordinator in the Obama administration, we supported law enforcement. So it was a chance to meet 
the director of the FBI, doing that internationally, visiting the Centers for um, Cybersecurity uh, Excellence in Australia, in, in the UK, GCHQ. So those things, because they were new, uh, really introduced me to what were some of the government's interests. So that kind of started the wheels turning about what could I do that might be interesting. And when my time at Symantec came to an end, um, someone introduced me to my predecessor leading the Defense Innovation Unit, Raj Shah. And we sat down and talked and he said, I'd love to see how you could help at DIU. And one of the things I need help with right away is a request that came from then Secretary Ash Carter. What are the Chinese doing with their investments in Silicon Valley, Boston and elsewhere? Uh, what are they after? What are they investing in? How large is it? And that's uh, when I wrote the paper that uh, uh, led to our introduction. Uh, I didn't really know much about uh, what China was doing. Uh, and it turns out the analysis showed they were doing a heck of a lot. And I didn't have a feel for whether the government should be taking a stronger role. Uh, I knew about CFIUS. It had some experience with uh, deals that had to go through CFIUS for approval. But my first inclination as someone who had been a business person all their life was, the last thing we need is more government help in this area. CFIUS probably can take care of it. And what I learned was, oh my goodness, CFIUS was created for an entirely different purpose than monitoring national security. We were afraid that uh, there was gonna be too much uh, uh, money from Arab countries here after the uh, oil embargo days during the Ford administration. That's, as you know, where CFIUS got uh, created. So it was never intended to be a tool uh, to, to protect our national security. So it did need some help. And so I was very fortunate after working on that study that brought us together to spend time uh, with some of the folks who were passing the FIRMA legislation, the Foreign Investment Risk Review Modernization Act, which strengthened CFIUS. And then there's a companion Export Control Reform Act that was passed, fortunately with overwhelming bipartisan uh, majorities. Uh, to really strengthen our ability on defense uh, to compete with China when uh, you know, we, we don't want to allow China to come in and pick off some of the key companies that could be critical of national security, for example, in the semiconductor industry. So I want to go a little bit deeper on CFIUS and FIRMA, but before we do, I'm just curious, okay, so this wasn't a, a problem that you had examined prior to getting the assignment from Raj and let's clarify, there's three Raj Shahs out there, so it's very confusing. There's a, a USAID Raj Shah in the Obama administration. I believe there is or was a White House Raj Shah. We're talking about the third Raj Shah, who was the head of DIUX or DIU prior to you. He's, you know, also a fighter pilot. He, you know, he yep. thinks he's really cool and wears F-16, avian. Air Force. Yeah, you know, he's been, I guess, moderately successful in business. So we're talking about the third Raj right. Shah. Uh, right. He tells uh, me that the name Raj Shah in certain parts of India are about as common as Mike Brown. <laughs> and Mike Gallagher in Dublin. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. Um, so what was your methodology? How did you go about collecting information? Did you just start talking to the people you knew in the venture world? How did you come up with this report? Yeah, so it was a lot of talking with folks, but also collecting some data there. Fortunately, were quite a few public sources of data about investments, uh, and venture capitalists use this data all the time to see who's investing in what. And it just turned out we were more interested in the uh, countries who might be investing. And one of the appendices in our report is what is, what is the uh, proportion of investment in early stage co uh, companies look like by country around the world. Most of it, of course, in the US is by US investors, but there's quite a few other countries who've invested because the US is such a source of, of innovation in a lot of, a lot of key areas like AI, like autonomous systems, like cyber. And as you, you described before, we had something called CFIUS, Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, that was an interagency mechanism that allowed us to look at such investments, but your analysis revealed that it was really not up to the task could you maybe give an example of some of the things that Chinese companies or government-backed Chinese companies were doing to get around the CFIUS requirements and why that we should care about that? Right. Well, China, as we know, has a very long-term systematic approach to transferring technology. One of the things that we uncovered was this wasn't an isolated strategy. It's part of a 
uh, well thought through plan on how technology uh, can be really uh, transferred to China and more of the innovation that China does is indigenous. Uh, so th th this is really important because we see China's rise from an economic standpoint in the 1970s, they were 10% of the US economy. Now they're the second largest economy in the world. That happened through some careful planning on their part. Uh, no other country has achieved such economic growth in such a short period of time um, in, in the modern era. So for the US to become uh, the you know, world's largest economy took uh, hundreds of years. Uh, and, and China did uh, their large scale economic growth in the last 50 years. So really a phenomenal achievement. And that was really done through technology. So if we look at the Chinese economy today, you know, we might have known them 10 years ago as a company that was built on low cost labor arbitrage. So um, low cost labor enables you to make clothing and toys and things like that. They've set their sights on being the world's leader in a lot of our high technology industry. So, their goals now have to do with advanced telecommunications equipment. That's why we're in a race on 5G uh, making satellites. They, in fact, had more launches of uh, rockets than the U.S. did last year. Uh, they have more uh, electric vehicles on the road, twice as many as the U.S. has. And, and they vertically integrated all the way back to the lithium mine. So they're the world's leading producer of lithium ion batteries. All of the growth in high speed rail. Uh, around the world really has happened uh, in China over the last decade. Um, electronics, we know them as the uh, electronics uh, manufacturer to the world, whether it's packaging semiconductors, building computers. Um, one of the frustrations for them so far, I mentioned semiconductors a minute ago, is they want to be producing more of those semiconductors themselves. So of the electronics they produce, uh, where they're the world's largest manufacturer, uh, they're producing actually a small percentage, around 10 or 12 percent of the semiconductors indigenously. So Chinese fabs, Chinese designs. That's changing with the growth of Huawei, and they have a goal of having that be 70 percent of what they uh, will ship out in electronics products. And that's a well-known program called Made in China 2025. So they have a goal of moving beyond their past uh, reasons for the economic growth into these high technology industries where it's much more important to control the standards, have uh, world leaders in terms of the companies, we'd call them domestic champions, uh, that can really set the standards because there's networking effects, which the U.S. is typically enjoyed by having world leaders uh, in electronics, whether, you know, it's an IBM moving to a Microsoft, um, moving to Google, we get a lot of benefit by really setting those standards around the world. That's what China wants to do. And now they've anointed, in addition to Huawei for 5G, companies like Baidu for AI that they expect to be the domestic champions going, for, going uh, into the future. And how, Mike, would you describe the pre-Mike Brown report view in Silicon Valley on Chinese capital and Chinese investment, where people blissfully unaware of what was going on or aware but didn't think that it mattered because we were in the process of integrating the CCP into the global economy and that would moderate their behavior. What was kind of the reaction in Silicon Valley? So it's, it's really incredible how much our view of China has evolved uh, over the last five years. And, and Mike, you remember this. So I'd say that in Silicon Valley, the predominant view was China is an incredible market growing faster than any other large economy in the world. So we got to have a piece of that and an incredible source of capital. So uh, if, but, but those impressions really run the gamut. And if we were talking to a, a company that had already competed with uh, uh, China, for example, uh, a Cisco who had competed with Huawei, you would have already heard a pretty jaundiced view that uh, Huawei has stolen our intellectual property <laughs> And it's pretty clear that after they steal that, they really have no interest in allowing a U.S. company to have broad access to the market. That uh, really the philosophy is let's take what we need from an intellectual property standpoint, compete successfully with the U.S., and eventually uh, displace the U.S. Uh, there was a great report by the Mercator Institute in Germany that talked about the reactions to China 2025, the big manufacturing. Uh, plan to uh, substitute imports 
external uh, uh, you know, sources of these products like semiconductors with a Chinese indigenous source. And, and uh, this report described there's kind of three phases of uh, doing business with China. One is the euphoria of, oh, this is incredible. All that growth, that huge Chinese market that's growing. The second stage is, huh, they've put a Chinese competitor right next to me and they really are on a path to make my life difficult. And the third is, oh my goodness, uh, there's really no Chinese market left. That Chinese competitor has now been successful and displaced me. So companies are on uh, a, a continuum at one of those three stages. It's not all synchronized for foreign companies going into China as they uh, develop uh, a larger and larger technology base so that their innovation can be indigenous and they don't want to rely on uh, uh, foreign uh, sources of technology. She himself has said uh, the goal is to catch up and then surpass the U.S. I want to plant a flag and come back to that cycle in one second, but I do okay. want to emphasize from my view, when the history of the new Cold War is written, the closest thing we will have to a long telegram, despite the attempts of many people to write such a thing, myself included, and failing miserably, um, will be your China study combined with some documents that Matt Pottinger had written in the campaign in 2016 that then formed the transition team. But I, and I'm not trying, I have, I have no reason to butter you up, Mike. I, in fact, I'm, I'm supposed to have an adversarial oposite relationship with you. Um, but I, your, your report you. really shocked me uh, into action and was the impetus for us passing FIRMA, which you alluded to before, which was a, a modernization enhancement of CFIUS, giving CFIUS tools that it did not have before. And I actually think that's one of the most significant pieces of legislation that we've passed in the last three years. Um, do you think FIRMA, I mean, the jury's still out, dust still settling, but what would be kind of the grade you'd give to FIRMA now, a, a year, a little less than a year removed, I guess, from full implementation of it? Yeah, well, you'd, you'd, uh, you, you asked before kind of what did, uh, what improvements did FIRMA make? Maybe just touch on that for a minute before we, before Great. we grade it. Perfect. Uh, FIRMA uh, really was trying to expand the jurisdiction of CIFIA. So CIFIA, as you know, Mike, was really all about uh, acquisition. So if a Chinese company wanted to come in and buy a U.S. semiconductor manufacturer, as an example, uh, CFIUS would be able to say, no, that's important for national security. But CFIUS did not give, uh, uh, or uh, CFIUS did not have the authority to be able to monitor things like uh, companies that were in bankruptcy, whose assets uh, might be up for grabs, um, Transactions that might involve transfers of intellectual property through uh, a licensing arrangement, a joint venture, or even a minority investment that would give the investor, in this case, uh, China, access to the company's IP and know-how. So there were a lot of ways that that technology transfer could occur that were not a strict acquisition, where CFIUS did have jurisdiction, that we wanted to make sure was in the purview of CFIUS. And that's really what, what FIRMA did. I agree with you, pretty significant uh, legislation in terms of our defensive posture competing with China. Uh, maybe if we have time, we should talk about what we should be doing that's proactive. Absolutely. Because one of the things that's interesting about the paper that uh, I had a chance to write was uh, that uh, it was used immediately to talk about the defensive measures when we're not going to win a technology race. You called it a, a Cold War. I have some reasons on why I don't think it, Cold War is a good analogy. Well, I know I, I, should, I shouldn't have uh, provoked you because I know in your paper you deliberately, we, we, let's reserve five minutes where we can argue over the legacy of Cold War after, okay, towards great. the end of this. Okay, great. So uh, Mike's referring to uh, a second paper that was just published by Brookings, which is, are we ready to compete in a superpower marathon with China? And in that we argue the Cold War is not a very good analogy. Uh, but we'll, we'll come back to that later. Uh, the key point is we need to be making the investments in ourselves so that we can really double down on our own strengths to be innovative, to create the most productive, competitive economy in the world. That's how we're gonna win the tech race with China, not by putting the walls up and preventing them from doing acquisitions, uh, stealing IP, et cetera. Not that we shouldn't try to erect those defensive measures, 
we need to, but that's not the way we'll win a race. It's not the way we won uh, in the Cold War. We won by innovating. So uh, back to Cepheus and the grade. I'd have to give it an incomplete right now, and that's because it's taken a while, pretty significant piece of legislation, as you mentioned, it's taken a while for the, uh, uh, the agency's treasury, of course, uh, leads that, um, and uh, commerce has been responsible for looking at what are the critical emerging technologies uh, where we want to make sure we're being a lot more careful about where there's investment and where the where uh, products would be exported so that's part of the export uh, control reform regime so we don't really have all the rules in place they're coming into visibility right now so uh um assistant secretary tom uh, fedo at treasury is working on those i think he's getting close and uh, so is the commerce department to really put the teeth into firma at the same time the the chinese have now started to be aware of the more uh, critical environment, and I think we've seen a slowdown in their investment. Foreign direct investment is off 90%, according to Rhodium, uh, China in the U.S. since the time of the firma legislation. But their technology investments have ironically stayed at about the same level because we don't have the teeth yet with firma. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I would make uh, one point on firma and one final question on the defensive side of the equation before we transition to offense. I do think FIRMA is also an example of how the legislative process should work. In other words, we had a pretty long drawn out debate and argument over FIRMA. And honestly, it ended up being me and Denny Heck, a Democrat and Liz Cheney, arguing against some of my Republican colleagues who wanted to do FIRMA, but a different, had a different construct. There was all this argument over committee jurisdiction, Andy Barr and Jeb Hanserling, great guys, we, but we had a vicious debate. And then ultimately, we, everyone made compromises, and we got it passed. It wasn't perfect. We're going to have to figure out you know, where we can fix it going forward. But it was a big win, in my, in my humble opinion. And it all totally started agree with, you. with your totally analysis. Agree. On defense, you mentioned this cycle. Was that a Mercatus Center report that you referenced? Yeah. Uh -huh. So I, the argument I get from big, big tech companies when we play aggressive defense and say, okay, Huawei's on the entities list. You can't sell software that Huawei can use in its personal computers. Huawei's a, a Chinese telecommunications company trying to take over and dominate the global telecommunications industry. Uh, they'll say, well, if we don't sell to Huawei, someone else will, or they'll build it domestically. My argument is that they'll build it domestically eventually anyway. So you can either make that decision now while we have a chance of keeping non-Huawei alternatives alive and endure some small pain, or you can endure the hard pain, which your, your final phase of that cycle reminded me of that argument. Have you dealt with that argument in industry? How can we make a better argument to industry who still wants to do business with Huawei? Well, I think it's uh, really a question that it's, it's time to address in the U.S., uh, and it's the short-term nature of corporate thinking. Uh, and I can say, as a, as a former CEO of two Silicon Valley companies, you, even if your mindset is one that you want to be planning and thinking for the long term, you can't escape the short-term pressures that come from the quarterly earnings call, your investors who are looking for immediate returns and comparing you to other companies, uh, the additional pressure that's come from activism and private equity, which by their very nature, have much shorter time horizons, it's very difficult to escape. And if you take the short view, uh, you're always arguing for what, what can I sell in the next quarter and the long term be damned. Uh, it's too bad if we lose competitively long term to a Huawei in this case, or think about our country's competitive capability if we allow China to hollow out our capability. Individual CEOs are not uh, compensated or incentivized to deal with that problem. Here's where government needs to come in and provide some framework. So one of the arguments we make in the paper that I just co-authored with uh, Padmeet Singh and Eric Tuning, uh, are we ready to compete in a superpower marathon, is we really need to think about how do we change the mindset of our, our corporate leaders and then our owners, which are the institutional investors, to be thinking about the long term. So th these are some, we think of the four recommendations we made, the most difficult and challenging, it's gonna require the most reform um, of our capitalistic system, which we're both proud of, products of, <laughs> and appreciate the benefits of, but it is by its 
Nature over time, since the shareholder revolution of the 80s, increasingly focused us on the short term and the efficiency of capital. That's fine in a world where everyone has the same rules and we can trade freely with our partners and uh, products can move to the lowest cost place to produce them. But now we're seeing the limits of that uh, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, uh, the adversarial relationship with China. We don't want all our um, pharmaceutical ingredients to come from China. We don't want 97% of our antibiotics to come from China. And there's other important uh, areas, important to national security. We don't want to be uh, that reliant on China. So in a world like that, we have to have other considerations besides short-term profit maximization, quarterly earnings that have to be taken into account. And in our system today, they're not appropriately uh, factored in. And that's where I think we need some uh, great ideas, both from the business community and from government to think about how would we factor those in. So let's talk about the four ideas that you guys have put forward in your report. And I should note that when I was ta asking about uh, consulting, I was, I was setting up a scenario in which you criticized your co-author Tuning and his consulting <laughs> work. But again, you outsmarted me. Uh, he, he's a terrific guy, as you know, he's awesome. uh, back at McKinsey now. But uh, for those who don't know, spent some time as the um, uh, Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Industrial Policy. So spent a lot of time thinking about these issues. And then his most recent assignment was Chief of Staff to the Secretary of Defense. And did, did an job. incredible review and report of our defense industrial base, which I would, I would put in kind of the holy canon of new Cold War. We're not using that term uh, documents as well. Um, okay, so the first Great. thing, if I'm remembering correctly, that you talk about in terms of playing offense is to, in bol to bolster federal investment in R&D. Just talk briefly about why you think that's so important. Yeah, if we look at, uh, here, here's an area where we really need to apply one of the lessons of the Cold War. So while I'll call the competition very different. Well, there you go. It, you, you've, you've conceded that the Cold War is the best analogy. <laughs> okay, I'm going to challenge you on that. You're going to get to play We need a Manhattan Project. I guess that's technically pre-Cold War. Uh, <laughs> but I'm sorry, you, go ahead. You get to be in your adversarial role now. The reason why I don't think this competition is like the Cold War is, one, the Chinese economy is so much bigger than the Soviets ever uh, achieved. The Soviet economy, there's a lot of historical analysis that says how big did it get and, and various estimates, but somewhere in the range of 40 to 57% of the US economy uh, at its heyday. And China is already now at two thirds of our economy, if you measure it in dollars. And if you measure it in local currency, uh, China's already a bigger economy than ours. So much more economic resources than the Soviet Union. Second, well integrated. The Soviets uh, enjoyed having a closed economy, thought they could do it better. That was really to our advantage as we had an international system of allies and uh, we uh, were more sophisticated from a science and technology standpoint. So that really played the, to our strengths. Uh, China has learned those lessons well. They're well integrated and trying to be an even bigger part uh, they're the leading trading partner of dozens of countries. They're expanding globally their markets through the Belt and Road Initiative. So they're very much on to that. Uh, third would be they're very interested in international standards. We talked about Made in China 2025. The successor plan now is China Standards 2035. They see the benefit wow. of what they're doing with Huawei and being able to set a standard with 5G. And they think, wouldn't it be great to be doing that with other industries as well, whether it's... Um, satellites, computing, uh, uh, electric vehicles. If you're setting the standards around the world, which is a position the US enjoyed with its allies for the last uh, 50 years, a lot of benefits accrue to you, just like a lot of benefits accrue to the US of having the reserve currency in the world. So China's on to that and uh, trying to populate many of the standards committees globally uh, to make sure the standards are favorable for the technology they're developing. And lastly, we don't have the consensus that we did in the Cold War with our allies uh, to say this is what the strategy needs to be to compete with China. So we're a bit divided right now. We'd be a lot more effective with our defensive tools like FIRMA and export controls if all our allies were joining hands with us to say, yes, let's have a united front to make sure that China is competing more fairly. So it's for those reasons I don't think the Cold War is, uh, is a great analogy. So let me concede most of your points. I take <laughs> all of your points on the size and scope and nature of the Chinese economy 
In fact, I, I've often said that is what makes this different than our competition with the Soviet Union. We never had to, we never had to decouple from the Soviet Union because our economies were completely Already. uncoupled. Exactly. Uh, I would dispute a little bit the idea uh, and have often of a, a Cold War consensus, either within America or with our allies. We have notable examples throughout the Cold War of dissensus with our allies, just ask uh, the Brits uh, and others during the Suez crisis. Uh, Eisenhower and Churchill had many an argument. Uh, the list goes on and on. And within America, we had brutal debates about the different variants of containment. And there were all sort, I mean, go, the election of 1952 makes today's election look tame. I mean, Eisenhower was basically using McCarthy's from my district language when he was on the campaign trail. So the time we look back on as the halcyon days of, of, of heady mutually assured destruction was not as simple or as kumbaya as we think. But I concede all your points. I'm merely saying there's something between hot war, which we all want to avoid, and steady state diplomacy that's going on. The best analogy I can find is that of a Cold War. And indeed, the Chinese Communist Party uh, constantly accuses us of Cold War thinking in order to make it verboten to discuss these things. But this is a rabbit hole we don't have to go down, Mike. Tell us, what we can. you call it a superpower marathon, right, as a better descriptor. Okay, so uh, four fa uh, pillars for winning that marathon, in your opinion, starting with a, a massive investment in, in federal research and development, um, a Manhattan-like project for, for right. that. So uh, I, the reason we uh, came up with the term superpower marathon, the, it's widely known through the national security strategy and national defense strategy that we are transitioning from the war on terrorism to great power competition. I think that underplays the challenges in competing with China because they are the only country with the scale that really could be an existential threat Fortunately, I don't think they're as uh, trying to achieve military or political domination in the same way the Soviets were. Uh, but the, the virtue of their scale, their place in the global economy is, makes them a complete cut above Russia in terms of an adversary uh, to the US and will figure probably even more prominently in the future. And the fact that it's a marathon uh, means this could go on for quite some time. We need to be ready for this to be a generational or multi-generational fight. We need to have the conviction that that's what it's gonna take, and we need to be in shape to run that marathon, which the paper argues we're not. So back to the recommendation, uh, federally funded R&D, again, this is something that we can apply from the Cold War. If we look at uh, our response to Sputnik, it was uh, let's get in gear uh, with the space program. At the same time, we were miniaturizing electronics for nuclear weapons. Uh, Let's focus on science and technology. And that had tremendous spillover effects into the economy. So it wasn't just being preeminent in science and technology, which we're on the verge of losing that preeminence today. We really need to, to make that investment. But those spillover effects create entire new industries. So as a quick example, um, during the 1960s, one third of the semiconductor output of the United States went to the Apollo space program. So that's a way that defense was really um, seeding a new industry for us. And look how important semiconductors is for everything that we do uh, uh, with uh, uh, that as a foundation for our entire electronics, all of the uh, tremendous prosperity that's come from us dominating uh, the internet in terms of the companies and the innovation that come from that. GPS would be another example of technology we invested in that has tremendous spillover effects. We're missing that if we're not on the forefront of that. Government is really the place where you can have those long time horizons, invest in some things that don't work and some things that do spectacularly. A lot of folks are relying on the venture industry to provide that. The venture industry really is not interested in long-term research projects, things that have really high risk from a technical standpoint. They're interested in taking business model risk with proven technology. Mm. That's what they're really good at. So if we really wanna be in the forefront of science and technology, uh, we need the federal government to step in and be doing a much bigger job to try and create those breakthroughs that we had throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, just to give you a figure of merit, the 
a percentage of our GDP that is going to federally funded research today is 0 0.7. That was 2% at the height of the Cold War. Wow. So that would, if we, uh, in dollar terms, that would be about a $200 billion increase in the federally funded R&D today, pretty big ticket investment. And even that 0.7%, Half of that is spent uh, with health-related uh, research. Now, in a time of a pandemic, we're, we're very glad that that has been spent there. We probably should have been spending more there. But that says that the proportion spent on national security has really gone from 2% down to about 0.35%. So that has steadily declined as a proportion of our GDP since the 1960s. And I think it's time to renew that, not just for what that does for a national security standpoint, but for guaranteeing our economic prosperity for the next couple of decades. Since this will be a marathon, it will involve uh, quite a few years of, of competition. That, that provides the foundation. The second recommendation we made was about the talent. One of the other uh, benefits of uh, the space race uh, was the focus on growing our engineering uh, and uh, science talent. And uh, at that time, we uh, really increased the educational um, Emphasis on science and technology from elementary school uh, all the way through college and graduate programs. And that's also something we need to do again. Uh, one of the things that I learned in the first paper that was about Chinese investment was what was happening to the foreign student uh, proportion of um, STEM uh, education in the US. So it turns out that uh, about, we have about uh, a, th a third of the foreign students studying in the US uh, which is about a million students per year, are Chinese foreign nationals. But that increases dramatically when you look at the STEM fields. So about 25% of our STEM graduate uh, spots for masters and PhDs are Chinese foreign nationals. So we really have both worst of both worlds. We're allocating a big proportion of a world-class educational resource to Chinese foreign nationals. And then uh, we send those students home. Uh, so we're not benefiting in our own economy. So we need a much bigger proportion of uh, American and, and our uh, allies uh, benefiting from STEM programs. We probably need to expand those STEM programs. Uh, and we need all of the folks who graduate from those advanced programs to be contributing to our own economy and our own uh, uh, movement forward in terms of uh, technology breakthroughs. And then you're, you, you mentioned um, your, what I think is your final recommendation on the need to get off the short-termism in uh, in, in the private industry. Um, and your third recommendation, though, remind me is, oh, uh, economic statecraft, right? Which I right. assume would involve some level of selective decoupling from China. Well, it really is a, a more about us getting our own act together. Uh, China, because it has a very different system, which you and I certainly don't want to go to, uh, but everything's controlled in terms of thinking about the instruments of economic power from the top and yeah. they support national objectives. Now, we have a very decentralized economy, uh, but even in government, and this was the point we were making, it's pretty decentralized in who's making the economic policy. Uh, Congress, of course, has uh, uh, jurisdiction over the, the spending profile and tax policy, uh, but within the different executive agencies that is split up uh, in terms of who has responsibility for economic policy. Even at the White House, you have the National Economic Council, National Security Council. So we really need more integrated thinking, both at that intersection, uh, National Security Council, National Economic Council, uh, within the executive uh, agencies and departments to be working on a unified strategy. And then this also needs to involve uh, the private sector and academia as well. Uh, so a strategy to bring, uh, for example, if we want to make sure we're winners in some of these game-changing technologies like AI, cyber, autonomous systems, that really requires a more coordinated approach as saying this is a game-changing technology. We must win. So there's things the federal government needs to do. There's things academia needs to do. Uh, we want to support the businesses that are in those uh, fields. And we've tended to have more of a laissez-faire approach, of course, let the economy do what it will. Uh, we don't need to direct anything. That works fine, again, if all our allied partners are democracies that are doing the same thing. Uh, it's not quite as clear that that will be uh, yield the optimal outcome when we're competing with China, which does have a very firm view of what they want to do to make sure they become the technology leader in the 21st century in these game-changing technologies.
I just want to note that when you talk about that fourth pillar of in incentivizing a longer term perspective in business and private capital, I believe one of the things you recommend is just different metrics. So changing that quarterly onerous earnings requirement to a, a year long reporting requirement, sort of simple things that we could do just to change the metrics to change the incentives that business operate under, correct? Right. That's right. But we need our, the institutional owners to be in sync with us because uh, you can't have a fight between the corporate owners and their institutional investors. Those need to be in sync and we have to appeal to uh, everyone's uh, national interest uh, with the belief that if we focus on the long term and develop capabilities for the country, we're really going to have a more prosperous economy for the long term versus we might not be optimizing uh, next quarter's earnings. Uh, so final question on this before we move on to something a little bit different. You mentioned Sputnik, which I would note for the record is a Cold War analogy. Um, <laughs> the wake-up right? call, for sure, was a Cold now, War analogy. But it does seem like we've had multiple Sputnik moments, right? I mean, Obama mentions in the 2011 State of the Union, this is our Sputnik moment, talking about the need to invest in tech and STEM and a lot of the things you talk about, not our Sputnik moment. China OPM hack was my personal Sputnik moment when I got a letter in 2015. You know, we have had all these wake up calls and yet it hasn't had that galvanizing impact of a Sputnik moment. I believe you, I mean, well, one, why do you think we haven't had that sort of national wake up? And two, I think you say at one point in the report, we don't need to, we can't just wait for a Sputnik moment. We have to march out and do these things. I actually think it's China's strategy. Uh, it used to, used to be their strategy to uh, uh, hide their strengths, by their time. Uh, she has really changed that in terms of being much more out on the world stage to uh, say Asia for the Asians, meaning get out of our backyard. Um, the, uh, the China dream, which is really make China great again, uh, back to their long and proud history of 5,000 years where China really has been the dominant power in, in the region, if not their view of the world, if you go back far enough in time. They, they really um, have been smart not to uh, create the Sputnik moment. I think their uh, desired outcome would be for the U.S. to stay asleep and wake up after it's too late to change the outcome. So what we have to do is recognize we're in the superpower marathon, decide what do we need to do to get in shape to make sure that we have the best chance of optimizing our own outcome, which has a lot more to do with these reform and offensive measures we can take, uh, or not offensive, but on the offense rather than the defensive measures. Uh, and uh, in, in that way, we have to create that moment for ourselves rather than wait for that to come from, uh, come from the outside. And that can be a difficult thing with a number of challenges we face simultaneously in the 24-hour news cycle and social media to really get people's attention. I mean, everyone's focused on COVID right now for good reason, but we have to move beyond that to think about what will the geopolitical playing field look like over the next 50 years? What do we need to do? And this is true of government, as I'm sure you'd agree, to have that longer term perspective to see what do we need to do to make sure that we're optimizing the outcome for the long term. There's some, some great work being done uh, uh, by some of your colleagues now looking at from a defense standpoint the future of defense task force as we tend to look year by year what changes are we making how can we step out and say what changes do we make need to be making on a decade-long time horizon so we really optimize what we're spending on defense i want it we may have to go a few minutes over if that's okay um sure. but i want to talk a little bit just about you're at the helm of diu now no longer diux it's diu defense innovation unit what do you t talk to me about what you're excited about with what DIU is doing, where you see DIU going in the next few years? Um, how, you know, th they must have some incriminating piece of blackmail on you to convince you to have stayed there and abandoned, uh, you know, a life of luxury in the private sector. Talk to us about what you're working on at DIU. Uh, well, the Defense Innovation Unit uh, was created by uh, Ash Carter. We talked about him a few moments ago. He did a number of things to really stimulate some innovation in defense, the Defense Innovation Board, Defense Digital Service. The Defense Innovation Unit is out of his idea that there's so much happening in the commercial world with these game-changing technologies, again, AI, autonomous systems, cybersecurity, uh, bioengineering, so many things happening commercially that if we want to have the best technology for our armed forces, we need to be leveraging that commercial technology. In other words, we can't just always turn to the same 
suppliers who build our aircraft carriers and fighter aircraft, they may not be on the leading edge of, of some of these trends. So I think it was a brilliant idea, um, really a startup organization in 2015. I'm uh, pleased to say it's grown quite a bit now, still could be a lot bigger in terms of its influence, in terms of defense procurement, but now we've brought 60 first-time suppliers to the Defense Department in the last couple of years. We are working on about 35 projects per year, and these are projects to bring new capability um, in some of these uh, spaces to the Defense Department. Quick example, um, we're working on um, with NORAD, NORTHCOM, bringing consolidated operating picture from all of those sensors. Today, they have to look at a variety of different pictures and put those together. That takes up valuable time if you're trying to protect uh, North America. Better to have that done consolidated and have machines do it and save the decision-making time for humans to analyze what they're seeing rather than putting that picture together. So that's just one, one quick example. We're already working with some uh, companies that work on artificial intelligence platforms to bring our systems uh, to be, be more modern and more capable. It's the best job uh, I've ever had. It's a really fascinating uh, space being at this intersection of national security and technology. So do you think I, don't think, I don't know of any compromise that, that exists on me, but <laughs> maybe you do. No, you're, you're, you're clean. Unfortunately, this is, I, I used to be good at this as a human intelligence guy of digging up dirt, but no longer. Um, do you, do you think we, we've, uh, we're bridging slowly the gap that I think is real that exists between Silicon Valley and DOD. We've had some pro high profile stories related to Google not wanting to work with the Pentagon over lethal drone programs. Do you think we're kind of, we're starting to bridge that gap a little bit? I think we are. And I think it's because the, when we talk to small companies, it's not a, a question of whether they want to work with the, the defense department. It's a question about, can we lower the barriers enough to make it profitable for them to do so? So as you well know, the acquisition process of the Defense Department is fairly complex. We're able to leverage something that uh, you and Congress gave us called the Other Transaction Authority. How can we move with, uh, with more ease through that process uh, so that companies view that as not such a big hurdle so we can get to an answer faster on whether their solution works and then immediately move them to a production contract that can be lucrative. So most companies are fearful of how much time it will take, whether I can get a straight answer and uh, quickly uh, determine whether there's an opportunity. And that's really our job at Defense Innovation Unit is to make sure we can get them an answer quickly through a rapid prototyping and contracting process. Are you in the market for reservists and other people that are interested in working for, not me, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in the reserves, uh, but- uh, Absolutely. Okay. So we're fortunate to have one of the larger reserve components for our size. So DIU is a pretty small organization uh, at this point. We have about 100 people. Uh, we have 55 reservists from each branch of the service, and uh, we're always looking for talented people. So if you want to write me at michael at diu.mil. Uh, we're happy to get uh, get your background channel to our uh, joint reserve detachment. You're going to be inundated with tens of emails from the the tens of listeners we have on this podcast. You, you're talking well, millions, millions to, before we started. To start to bring this back to where we started, you mentioned you know growing up in Houston, you were interested in the space industry. You know, find yourself working near the space industry. I believe there's something like right across the street or nearby. So. There's a bit of beautiful symmetry to your life's journey. Um, but presumably you're not doing defense tech stuff all the time. You have a bookshelf behind you. When you're off duty and you need to just clear your head, what does is, what is Mike Brown like to do? Well, I'm an amateur uh, musician. Uh, I spend a little bit of my time on the uh, uh, board of the Berkeley College of Music in Boston, and I play in an amateur rock dance band here in Palo Alto. So what do you play? I play keys and uh, it's all the dance hits from 60s to some of the more current music. And our most recent engagement was actually playing for the Defense Innovation Unit. Uh, we had a, a meeting and it was a dining out experience, which you'd probably know, a black tie event. And so <laughs> it, was, it was great fun to play for um, my team at, at DIU. That is awesome. Who, okay, I have so many questions related to that. For, well, what's your, your band, what's like your closing and or your encore number? Like your surefire, you know, when the dance floor is lagging a bit, you can play this and everyone's gonna get fired up. 
uh, Uptown Funk is still pretty popular. Wow. Okay. But some of the oldies um, are also still pretty good. Love Shack always gets people up and dancing, as an example. I should have had you for my wedding in September, Mike. This would have been. <laughs> I'd love to have done it. Serendipity. Uh, that's awesome. Who who were your musical idols growing up? Is there a a particular keyboardist that you admire or? Well, I I actually grew up playing classical music, okay. uh, and so that was a good training. But uh, I really had to uh, learn how to be in a band where nothing's written down. So in, as a classical uh, musician, everything's written down for you. So there's you can interpret what's there, but there's there's really uh, there's really pretty strict rules. Here, anything goes. We're trying to keep a sound that is very close to what the original record or CD recording was. Uh, so that gives you a guide, but nothing's written down. So that makes it a little bit of a challenge for, for someone like me. Uh, my musical idol today is Van Morrison. Very versatile nice. style. Somebody with an Irish heritage, so I know you'd appreciate that. But between blues, jazz, rock, even a little country infused there, Celtic influence, he brings a lot of styles together. And I love that fusion that he brings. That is a great, great answer. Um, okay. So who do you have any, uh, well, if I were to, if I were to look at your bookshelf, what would be kind of the top, are there works that you keep coming back to time and again that have had a profound influence on you? I know I'm putting you on the spot. Well, I think uh, I read uh, uh, Jim Mattis's Call Sign Chaos pretty recently. It's a great book. When I was, He's not uh, your boss anymore. You don't have to say that. <laughs> he is a phenomenal leader. I, I, I really can't say I've worked for anyone that has been more inspirational than, than, uh, than General Mattis. Really, just phenomenal. Um, and yeah, you, did you serve with him? Uh, uh, I, I, I guess technically, yes, but I was, you know, so far down the totem pole, you know, it would not, there was no interaction between Second Lieutenant Gallagher and, and General Mattis at any point. <laughs> Uh, great, great book. Uh, and then uh, um, uh, Destined for War. I know uh, you've read that book. Uh, Graham, Graham Allison. Allison book, yeah. That is a great book that really looks at uh, much more than China, but uh, the rise of um, uh, emerging powers and when they meet a dominant power, what happens and takes a historical view. That's a, a pretty interesting, pretty interesting read. Do you read fiction or is it all business? Uh, I'm really reading uh, business and history. Uh, and my wife is a fiction writer. Is that right? Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. What can we, where can I read something she's, she's written? Well, she's uh, getting her first uh, book published. So I'll let you know when that. Oh, fantastic. Out. That's awesome. Congratulations to her. I love that. Um, do you have any lowbrow addictions in, in, in the realm of TV or, or movies? <laughs> Well, I'm getting reacquainted with that now uh, during the COVID era. So, uh, yeah, uh, I'm watching Money Heist now, as is most of the world. I don't know if you've gone on to that, the Spanish I, program. We're, we've, we've done a few episodes. We're not quite hooked yet, but yeah, it's, it's, it's quite good. good. Occupied, which is a Norwegian. Oh, uh, I've watched Occupied. Yes, excellent. very good. Excellent. And then Fauda, the yes. Israeli program. So. You may have recommended Fauda to me actually at one point, which is why I watched it. Um, okay, good. so final question for Mike Brown, the head of DIU. Um, let's say you come to Green Bay, and we'd love to have you here. We have a great uh, kind of innovation hub here called Title Town Tech, which is a joint venture between the Packers and Microsoft, and it's really cool. Um, and so there'd be a, a very, I think, a lot of synergy. Let's uh, do it. So we have you out here, you know, we celebrate afterwards, uh, we're at the bar and, and someone come, you know, a kid comes up to us who's there with his parents uh, and asks you, says, you know, are you Mike Brown? I'm a huge fan of your work. Uh, I want to pursue a career in both business and, and policy. What advice would you have for me? Yeah, th this, uh, this uh, role is really a great combination of uh, uh, different worlds. So the good news is you could enter it from any number of places. So I think good background would be what you did earlier on. So being in, in the service would be an excellent background for this. And then my background, obviously, from the business side. And at some point, you need to get those two mixed. Uh, our government doesn't make it easy to make a lot of transitions uh, across. We have that's something we need to work on if we want more uh, talent. Uh, joining the government that 
that has some technology experience. But I think you could enter from easier and then you have to enter from either and then you have to figure out what is a crossover point. Because I think it's that combination of seeing both that really helps you uh, in a role like yours or a role like mine. Absolutely. Well, Mike, we will look forward to the day when you journey to Green Bay, Wisconsin. Uh, we thank you for helping us take a new look at defense and innovation and tech and U.S.-China competition. And sincerely, uh, as someone who works on these issues, thank you for your willingness to step up and serve in this role, particularly given that you could have stayed in the private sector and made far more money uh, than you are as a government servant. Uh, but it is very much appreciated, and that's exactly the model of, of we need people that are willing to take their unique experience and serve for a period of time in the federal government. And so thank you for that, Mike. Well, thank and, you. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that. Look, yep, absolutely. We'll look forward to seeing you in person soon. Okay. Look forward to being in Green Bay. All right. Go Packers. <laughs>